Welcome to Anchors for Life. We're glad you're with us once again, and we are taking up a, a series, a new series, on the sayings of the Lord Jesus from the cross. We think of these uh, expressions that the Lord Jesus made from Calvary while he was uh, between heaven and earth, be hanging between a holy and righteous God and sinful man. And uh, certainly as we think of these seven sayings, uh, it is very sobering for us to look at this. And someone has, someone has called these seven sayings cries from the cross. And really, that expresses the, the atmosphere of anguish that was there. And certainly, we have to say that it's, it's holy ground for us to consider as we think about the cross. Uh, we think of Matthew chapter 27, for example, verses 27 to 31. Uh, where we read that the soldiers uh, of the governor took the Lord Jesus into the praetorium and they gathered uh, the whole garrison around him. And then it says that they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted the crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him, and they took the robe off of him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. When I read those verses, the things that, that happened to the Lord Jesus leading up to the crucifixion, I think of the scourging and the stripping and the spitting and the striking of the Lord Jesus that, that all was a precursor to Calvary, to the crucifixion. Isaiah sheds insight on it in a, giving us a prophetic picture. And he says, just as many were astonished at you, so his vision was marred more than any man. And his form more than the sons of men. That's Isaiah 52, verse 14. And we have Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 5, that remind us that he was despised. He was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes you are healed. And we clearly see as we listen to those words, as we read that, those scriptures, we can certainly see the, the atmosphere of anguish that was there at Calvary. And as we view the cross, it really reveals to us the heart of God, that God so loved the world that he would give his only begotten son. He would allow his son to go into the depths of Calvary, demonstrating his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, that he would have the Lord Jesus Christ die for us, as Romans 8 verse 5 would tell us. The cross also reveals the heart of mankind. When we look at the cross, we see the love of God. But then we look at the cross and we see the heart of man and we see it in its totality, in its, in its ugliness, and we see it in its wickedness. We see the... the uh, all the hatred toward God coming out uh, toward the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we look at the cross, we not only see the love of God and the hatred of man, but we also see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see his heart being poured out at Calvary. And when we look at these expressions that we're going to be looking at, we see his heart being manifested. Uh, the first three, as a matter of fact, the first three expressions from the cross uh, give us his tender heart toward others. They're very much others occupied, others oriented when we look at 
those first three expressions. And the last three expressions, we can say, uh, really have to do with the Lord Jesus and himself personally. But then there's that middle expression where we read, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is that fourth expression. And it's that fourth expression that bridges the gap between the needs of others and the, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And, and it was because he was forsaken that he met our need at the cross. He was forsaken by a holy and a righteous God. So when we see these three, these seven different sayings at the cross, coming from the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this wonderful commentary in his own words of the forgiveness, of salvation, of love, of atonement, of suffering, of victory, and of security. That's what we find in the seven expressions. If I was to boil all those seven expressions down to one word each, we would have the first one being forgiveness, the second one being salvation, the third one being love, the fourth one being atonement, the fifth one being suffering, the, se the sixth one being victory that is found, and the last one being security that can be enjoyed now. So we look at those seven expressions, those seven sayings from the cross, and looking at the very first one now, we find words of forgiveness, words of forgiveness. And that's in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. We hear the Lord Jesus saying, uh, Father, forgive them. There he is. And we remind ourselves that every time he would have to speak, he would have to lift himself. He would have to pull himself up to be able to verbalize, to be able to get the air, to be able to speak. And there the Lord Jesus he pulled himself up as he looked at all that was happening to him, as he would re be reminded of what he just went through at the hands of men. And then he looked at the crowd. He looked at the foot of the cross. He saw at the foot of the cross the crowds that had set away with him. We not have this man reign over us. And he would say, Father, forgive them. He would look at the centurion uh, the, the Roman soldiers and who had driven the nails into his hands and he would say, Father, forgive them. He would look at those uh, Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders who had led the people to this conclusion away with him and he would say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. When we consider this expression that's, that's made here, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first and the last words of the Lord Jesus are addressed to the Father. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And, and both are addressed to the Father. And then we have the, the expression in the middle where he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He doesn't address the Father in the middle, when he's talking about being forsaken, he doesn't address the Father. He addresses God because it has to do with atonement that is being made. That in order for you and I to be redeemed and, and, and to be brought back to God, there had to be that offering. That judgment had to be paid. And we find there that the Lord Jesus would declare, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And when we see this here, this expression of him asking for the Father to forgive, someone has said that he, he could ask the Father to forgive because he was always about the Father's business. You think of that at the age of 12, he declared to Joseph and to Mary, did you, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my Father's business? Luke 2, 49. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, we hear the Lord Jesus praying. And he says, oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Matthew 26, 39. Our Savior would drink that cup of judgment to the very last drop in order that you and I might know forgiveness, the forgiveness of God. But it's interesting to see that this forgiveness that we're talking about was actually prophesied in the Old Testament. This very forgiveness that the Lord Jesus would announce from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This was prophesied in the Old Testament. This very scene that we're looking at was prophesied back in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, where we read, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. And that last part, he made, he made intercession for the transgressors. You think of that. That's really what the Lord Jesus did on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Our Lord prayed for those who crucified him. And in doing so, he fulfilled this Old Testament prophecy. We look at Luke chapter 22 verses 63 to 65 and we read this that now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him and having blindfolded him they struck him on the face and asked him prophesy who who is this that struck you and many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. And when we pause and think about this, they spit on him. They put a robe on him. They put a scepter in his hand. They placed that crown of thorns on his brow. They beat it in with a rod. They rejected him as their king and said, We have no king but Caesar, John 19, 5. They laughed at his claims of being the son of God, Luke 23, 35. They were ignorant of the fact that every one of their actions was a fulfillment of Scripture. They parted his garments, Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. They gave him vinegar to drink, Psalm sixty-nine, twenty-one. They crucified him between two thieves, Isaiah fifty-three, twelve. And even the fourth cry that we talked about, the fourth cry from the cross, was a fulfillment of Scripture. And so their very actions fulfilled God's plans. And you could write down Psalm 76 verse 10 to help us see that. So this forgiveness was prophesied. But also this forgiveness was taught and demonstrated in his ministry. Right up to his final hours on earth, the Lord Jesus was preaching forgiveness and teaching forgiveness in his example. In fact, in, in, he gave that example of, in, in, uh, when he gave the disciples an example of prayer, the Lord Jesus would tell them. He would tell them and teach them to say, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. For, and then he would also say, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And there he's talking about relational forgiveness, but it was all part of his teaching. And when asked by Peter, you remember this, when he was asked by Peter, how often should I forgive someone? And the Lord and Peter thought he was doing pretty good by saying um, seven times. And the Lord Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. And so the Lord Jesus was teaching. In fact, that whole chapter in Matthew chapter 18, that whole chapter is teaching on forgiveness. And the Lord Jesus in Mark chapter 2, the Lord Jesus forgave that parallel at Capernaum. Mark chapter 2, verse 3 to 12. 
the sinful woman who was anointed, who anointed him in Simon's, uh, Simon the Pharisee's home. In Luke chapter 7, verses 37 to 48, the woman caught in adultery was forgiven. She was about to be stoned, but the Lord Jesus forgave her her sins. John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. During the institution of the Lord's Supper, when the Lord Jesus would gather his disciples in that upper room and, and institute the Lord's Supper, he would instruct them to drink of the cup. And he would say this, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. Matthew 26, 27 to 28. And even following his resurrection, his first act was to commission his disciples to forgive. In, uh, in John's gospel, chapter 20, we see this where he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of many, they are forgiven. And if you retain the sins of many, they are retained. And the Lord Jesus here upon the cross was teaching the very thing that he preached for those three years of public ministry. So we see the, the, this forgiveness was prophesied. This forgiveness was taught and, and demonstrated throughout the ministry of the Lord Jesus. But this forgiveness was the very purpose of his death. Forgiveness was why the Lord Jesus was on the cross, at least one of the reasons, one of the um, lasting impact and results of his crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection, that we might know forgiveness. The Lord Jesus came that he might go to Calvary and die upon the cross that we might experience the forgiveness of sins. We have to say that forgiveness is free. But dear friend, forgiveness was not cheap. It cost the blessed Lord Jesus his life. We think of that scene. I think of that scene at Calvary when the Lord Jesus would say there, hanging from the cross, and he would say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I think of that scene. I think of what it must have looked like when he was hanging between two malefactors, two thieves, one on one side and one on the other. The perfect spotless one surrounded by those at the foot of the cross, jeering, taunting, mocking, ridiculing him looking down from that cross with a full heart of love, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The way this is written, grammatically, the way that is written, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When it says, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That little word said has the idea of repeating it over and over again. It's in the imperfect tense, which means that he kept on saying it. And I thought of that. And, and when, when I read that in studying this, I, I thought to myself that where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. It should cause us to pause and consider what it was for our Savior hanging there on that cross, saying, after all that they did toward him, saying, Father, forgive them. And then to add to that, that they know not what they do. How could that be? How could it be that they didn't know what they were doing? Think of all they did to him. How could the Lord Jesus say they did not know what they were doing? Certainly, Judas knew that he had betrayed innocent blood because he said so in Matthew chapter 27, verses 3 to 4. Pilate knew that he condemned a faultless man because he said so in John chapter 19, verses 3 and six. The Sanhedrin, they knew that they 
had to premeditate and they had to uh, go out and find false witnesses. They knew that is what they did. Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 and 60. All of these were not ignorant of the facts of their guilt, but they were ignorant of the enormity of, their, of the sins against the Lord Jesus. In fact, we have this in Scripture for us, both Paul and Peter. Paul says, uh, he informs us that none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't know the enormity of this sin against the Lord Jesus. They had no way of knowing the magnitude of this sin against the Lord Jesus. In, in other words, they were not aware of the full scope of their wickedness. And Peter would declare, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it, did it, crucified the Lord, in ignorance, as did also your rulers. He says that in Acts chapter 3, verse 17. Their evil heart was the very reason the Lord Jesus came down and died on Calvary. F.B. Meyer wrote that in uttering this first cry from the cross, our Lord entered that work of intercession, which he ever lives to continue on our behalf. He thinks not of himself, but of others. He is occupied not of his, with his own pain, but with their sins. He makes no threat, but instead offers a tender prayer of pleading intercession. We might ask the question, was this prayer ever answered when the Lord Jesus prayed and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Was this prayer ever answered? And, and of course, the answer is yes. In fact, fairly immediately, it was answered. The thief on the, on the one side of him was mocking him and the thief on the other side, and we'll look at this next time, but there was an answer given to this. Well, at one time they were both mocking, but now this one repented. And the Lord Jesus could say to him, today you will be with me at paradise, in paradise. And shortly after that, when the crucifixion was over, the centurion looked up and he looked up and the very soldiers that were responsible for carrying out the crucifixion, they said, truly, this was the son of God. And there was repentance. There was conversion. And so right away, we see two results where this prayer of the Lord Jesus was answered immediately. But then we think, of, uh, we think of what the Jews said. Right before the cross, the Jews demanded his death and declared, His blood be upon us and our children. Now that's important. His blood be upon us and, his, and our children. Matthew 27, 25. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he preached declaring, therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When you look at that first um, message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, it is a Christ-centered message. And he preaches the incarnation of Christ. He preaches the uh, crucifixion of Christ. He preaches the uh, resurrection of Christ. He preaches the exaltation, the glorification of Christ. He set the Lord Jesus Christ before them. And the Spirit of God did a work in their hearts. And we hear them, them saying, we read this on the day of Pentecost, when he stands up and preaches this message to them. Their response 
was that the scripture says they were cut to the heart with conviction. And they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter responded to them and said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise, now listen to this, for the promise is for you. The promise is to you and to your children. Now that's important. And to all those who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And so we see a couple of things there. One, we see in Matthew 27, they said his blood be upon us and our children. But where we said where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. We see the the mercy, we see the grace, we see the love of God being extended. Well, they would say his death, his blood be upon us and our children. We see that when the Lord Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, that this prayer was answered when the saving grace of God was being offered through Peter to these some of these very ones who said his blood be upon us and our children. And we read the promises to you and to your children. What great grace. We read that in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 39, by the way. So these first words of the Lord Jesus, when we look at these first words of the Lord Jesus that he spoke from the cross, reminding us of why he came into the world, Paul will remind us of this, that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1, 7. And then Paul would remind us in Colossians uh, also that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. That's in the first chapter of Colossians. So when we look at this expression where the Lord Jesus would say, Father, forgive them. We know that the Lord Jesus endured all that he endured at the hands of man. And then in the three hours of darkness, uh, we see what he endured at the hands of a holy and righteous God. And because his blood was shed, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness for all your sin and all of my sin. And this expression that the Lord Jesus made at the cross, this first expression, this first saying, this first cry from the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It reminds us of why he went to the cross. We know that he endured death. His blood was shed. And the blessed Lord Jesus died on Calvary's cross. And he went into the grave and came out victorious and is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high today. And he's returning. And I would ask you this, dear friend, as we would wrap this up, I would ask you this. When the Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, He was looking down the corridor of time to this very moment right now. And he was saying, and he has paid the price in what he endured in the rest of his time on Calvary. What he endured, he's paid the price so that there might be forgiveness for you today. Do you know the Lord Jesus? And if you do not know him, we ask that you would Uh, contact us at Anchors for Life. We would ask that you would go to the website and that you would contact us and that you would let us know that you're interested in accepting the Lord Jesus Christ and growing and knowing more of him. But I tell you, dear friend, you don't have to wait. You can accept the Lord Jesus Christ this very moment. Just bow your head. Tell the Lord Jesus you're sorry for your sin. Tell the Lord Jesus you know he shed his precious blood for you and repent of your sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believing is not intellectually, it's with all your heart. 
And would you come to him today? Because he said for you, Father, forgive them. That's what he endured at Calvary's cross for you, dear friend. So we invite you to come back uh, next week. We'll be here again and we'll be uh, looking at that second saying from the cross. May the Lord bless his word to your heart today.